Well, I don't know what's going on specifically in your life as we gather together to worship this morning as you or as you join us online. Um, but I do know this. I do know that because of a blood-stained cross and an empty tomb, as Mark said, there is hope for us all. There is hope for us all. There is hope for our world. There is hope for our country. And there is hope for you. And so that is the spirit that we meet together this morning, in spite of everything that's going on, to remember that there is there's hope. There's hope. So I'm continuing in this series, Majnik. And again, word Majnik, it's not the, the latest Russian rocket ship. I didn't fall down and hit my head and begin making up words yet. That's probably coming. But it's just, it's the word kingdom spelled backwards. And we've been talking about how one of the predominant teachings that Jesus um, repeated over and over again was teaching about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And yet, as he describes the kingdom of heaven, it's, it's, it's backwards. It's upside down. It's backwards. It goes against the grain of the kingdom of this, of this world. It's a countercultural, radically different kind of kingdom. But Jesus loved talking about it. He loved talking about the kingdom of God. He brought it up all the time in messages and in conversations and just whenever he could. And if you're counting in the four Gospels alone, Jesus brings it up at least 126 times. And yet the things that he says about it seem backwards and flipped upside down to us. And yet Jesus is the one that taught us to pray, didn't he? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, we're, we're to pray, God, may, may some of your kingdom, until Christ returns and this entire world is your kingdom, May some of the things that distinguish your kingdom, may they come down here in the kingdom of this world so that we might live more like you. So this morning, I want to, want to focus on the end of this word majkin um, and, or majnik, and we've been focusing on one or two letters a week, and, and the end today for, for not to us, Lord, not to us, Lord. Now, this might be surprising to you, but the first book of the Bible doesn't say, in the beginning, you. It says, in the beginning, who? God. I love the first line to Rick Warren's phenomenal best-selling book, Purpose Driven Life, several years ago. It begins with this very first sentence, it's not about you. It's not about you. And yet, we oftentimes make almost everything about us, don't we? But it's not about us. In Psalm 115, verse 1, going to be kind of our theme for this message. When the psalmist would write, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and because of your faithfulness. Not to us, Lord. Not to us, Lord. Lord, help us not to live our lives just for us, but to give you glory. And so this morning, I thought it'd be a good chance and good opportunity as we focus on on this letter, not to us, to talk about worship, to talk about, about praising God and, and giving God glory. And I want to talk specifically uh, about why we worship, how we worship, and then who we worship. All right, but why, why do we worship? Why do we worship? Why do we sing? Lord, not to you or not to us, but to you be the glory. Well, because this amazing God that we worship is loving and faithful. He's not at all like human beings who are notoriously unloving and unfaithful. So he is loving and faithful. And the Bible uses this word of God, holy. Holy is simply a word that means to be, to be set apart. And in the Bible, we get, we get little glimpses of the angels and the heavenly hosts praising God. And they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Exodus 15, 11, Moses and the, and the Israelites, the children of God, saying to God, who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, and working wonders? Well, that's really a rhetorical question because the answer is obviously nobody. There is nobody like our God. Hannah, in, in 1 Samuel 2, 2, Hannah said, there is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. 
And in the Bible, there's always a healthy fear of God. When people are confronted with his holiness or, or when people are confronted with angels who come from the very presence of God, there's oftentimes a healthy fear. They weren't just, they weren't just casual about it. They didn't think about God as he, he's, the big, he's the big guy upstairs, you know, or some colloquial term we use. But they oftentimes had a, had a reaction that bordered on terror. They were afraid, they were intimidated, they were overwhelmed because they knew, they knew that they were sinful people, that they were moral follow-ups, and now here they are in the presence of the stainless, sinless, perfect, holy God. Abraham confesses in the Old Testament that he is nothing but dust and ashes. Habakkuk hears the voice of the Lord, and he reacts with, with heart pounding and quivering lips and trembling legs. Psalm 96, 9 says, Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all of the earth. You see, when we see God's holiness and when we, when we sense it, we, we, we understand that really we, we deserve death is what we deserve. The Bible says this because we are sinners. That is, that is what we deserve. That is the wages of, of our sin is death. But then we realize that God in his incredible love and grace sent us a Savior and so we sing, we sing not to us, Lord, but to your name be the glory. I love what Hebrews 12, 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. And then it goes on to say, for our God is a consuming fire. That is, that is, that is why we worship, because God because God is a holy, awesome God. That is why we, we ascribe worth to him. That's what the word worship means. We just, we just ascribe worth to who he is. That, is. that is why we worship. Then the question becomes this, and this is a question that people have argued about, fought about, churches have divided over this. Well, how should we worship? Yeah, we, we get it. We're supposed to worship God, but how should we worship? What style of worship does God like? What style does he prefer? What kind of music does God want to be worshipped with? And again, this, this has been an, an issue in the church. Uh, hopefully it's not as bad as it was. But going back 20, 30, 40, 50 years, this was, this was an issue. What kind, of, what kind of music should we sing? Should we use hymnals or overhead projectors? Should the lights be bright or dim? All of these things surrounding how, how should we worship. Well, it's not really a mystery. I want to, I want to share with you this morning because God, God wrote, wrote a book called the book of Psalms. And in the book of Psalms, there's 150 of these things. And it talks about how God, how God likes to be worshiped. So Psalms is pretty much God saying, well, this is how, these are some of the, the characteristics that I want worship of me to have. And, um, and I want to look at a couple of them this morning, but I want you to know right now that when we read the book of Psalms in its entirety, and then when we put in other parts of the Bible, um, worship of God oftentimes looks more like, a, like, a, uh, like how we react at a concert or a ball game rather than a nice, quiet church service. In the book of Psalms, it talks about exuberant worship and hands being raised and, 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 and instruments and noise and loudness. Now, we live in a culture that we love our sports. We love our sports. I'm still kind of in mourning. It's so difficult for us, man. I want to tell you, when they said last March that, okay, we're going to have the, the, the NCAA tournament, but there's not going to be any fans, like, my heart sank because, man, that's such a part of it, and that, that energizes the players. And then when they said the next day, after, after Indiana University won the last college game, right, Remember what I told you? So they're champions because they won the last game played. But then they said there's not going to be any tournament at all. And, and I think, at least for me, I realized that I kind of almost bordered on idolatry with how much I looked forward to uh, the March Madness tournament. Uh, but for some reason, when we go to a game, and there will be games again one of these days, hopefully, when we go to a game, we, we show excitement and, and we love it. And, and sometimes we're called fans. Sometimes we're called fanatics. Now, some of you, you've, you've gone beyond being a fan of your team. You're a fanatic. Somebody said, well, what's the difference between a fan and a fanatic? And somebody said, well, it's body paint. Like if you, if you, have, if you, if you paint your body like whatever color, you know, then, then you've gone from a fan to they ought to lock you up. But, but, but in, in Psalms is written, the book of Psalms is written in the Hebrew language. 
Now, we have great translations in English of the Psalms, and we can trust them, but here's the problem. And you might be aware of this, that the Hebrew language that the Old Testament was written in has more words than we have in our English language. It's an ancient language. It's an entirely different language family than modern English. And so there are sometimes things that are lost in the translation from Hebrew to English. And so... So, for example, you can be reading through the Psalms in English, and you can come across a word like, like praise. And especially in Psalms, that word comes up a lot. But the word usually translated praise in English may be one of at least seven completely different words. Com completely different words. And to answer the question, how should we worship, I want to look at some of these different words that we, are, that we read as praise, and yet there's some different words, Hebrew words, behind those, and they, and they help us understand a little bit more about what it means biblically to praise God. And so I want to look at just seven of these this morning. And so the first word that you might see uh, sometimes as praise, or sometimes they transliterate this one, is the word hallel, hallel. Uh, we see the word uh, translated hallel, sometimes it's praise, but we get this word hallelujah from it. Hallelujah, the end of hallelujah, Yah being a, part, a name for God. And then hallel, praise, praising God, worship. And the definition of hallel in terms of praise would be this, to rave, to boast, to celebrate. And then my favorite, to be clamorously foolish. This is what the official Hebrew lexicon says of this word, to be clamorously foolish. In other words, God likes it when we go a little crazy. Don't know about body paint, but I think that God, God likes it when we, when we go a little crazy. When somebody looks at you and says, man, you are, you are over the top. Like God likes that. Now that makes total sense to us, right? When we go to a, when we go to a, a ball game or a concert or, or whatever else. But we think it's irreverent in church. And the question is, why is that? That's one way that we express worship. God is looking for people that are excited to be in his presence, excited to be in his house, excited to be with his people, excited to worship him. And so the, the, one of the verses for this is Psalm 35, 18. I will give you thanks in the great assembly among the throngs. I will hallel you. I will praise you. I will worship you. And so this word, which occurs more than the others, this word kind of takes us out of our comfort zones at times. And now certainly it can be taken to a, an unbiblical extreme when the only goal of worship is, is to get in some kind of emotional fervor or frenzy. And yet most of us, most of us loved ones, including myself, we are so far on the other side of that. Um, we are so far to the other extreme. I was a, a youth minister at a church in, in East Tennessee um, for three years, and this always amused me. It's not just that church, it's every church, including this one. But for some reason, as a young seminary student, you know, I, I kind of thought it was amusing because, you know, I, I was in seminary and I knew everything. Like, seriously, I knew everything. But we used to sing this song, and, 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 and it was the great song, Stand Up for Stand Up for Jesus. But we'd be sitting down when we sung it, right? That, that just doesn't make a lot of sense, and nobody thought anything about it. Fact of the matter is that in that church, as it is in many churches, if, you, if somebody would have raised their hand in worship in that church, another person would have called in an exorcist, right? Like, like you're fanatic, you're going, you're going too far. And yet most of us need to take a step further in the direction of being more emotive and, and honestly being more fanatical in our worship of God. We need to give God praise, not just because he deserves it and is worthy of it, but in the way that he wants it, which at times to other people, especially who aren't believers, might look like we're kind of over the top. Like we've, like we've lost our minds. Another word, another word for praise is the word yada. Now in Hebrew, yada can mean different things unrelated to, to worship and praise, but here it means to worship with an extended hand. To worship with an extended hand. Now, many people, I saw it just a little bit ago, many people like to, to raise hands in worship. And it's just something that comes natural to you, and you do it, and it's a great thing. It's very biblical. And when you think about it, again, going back to sports, we do that in, in, in sporting events. In fact, when, in football, when somebody scores a touchdown, what do the referees do? They raise up both hands, right? Like, like some of you didn't know that. that that's what, remember, that <laughs> touchdown? Um... 
Psalm 138 1 says, I, I will yada you, O Lord. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will, I will lift hands and worship to you with all my heart. I had been here at the church, I don't know, a couple of years, and um, um, somebody came up to me after church, and they said, hey, Chris, hey, hey, I just wanted you to know that, that worship was really, really great today, and, and it, I felt so sp- inspired. I, wanted, I just felt like I wanted to raise my hands, but then they said, but I know that we don't do that in our church. And I wanted to say, where in the world did you get that idea from? It's not from me. We've never made a declaration in this church, we shall not raise hands. And so we want people to be, to be free to express worship in ways that are, you're led by the Spirit, that are meaningful to you. Now, we don't want to have this to be something where we, where we say, okay, we're all going to raise hands now. Like, we want it to be natural to you in worship, but please understand that we want you to worship in, in ways that you are led. And if, if, if anybody crosses the line, we will let you know. But we are so far from that line, I don't think we can even see it, most of us, including myself, right? Right? Well, here's another word, Barak. Barak, yes, it sounds like that other Barak that we know. It means to, to, to bless by kneeling or, or bowing. And here, here we have the sense of worship as, as, as submission and humbling ourselves. Psalm 103, 1 says, Barak the Lord, O my soul, and all my inmost being, Barak his holy name. It's a, it's a posture. It's, a, it's one of humility, now, a big problem in the American churches these days, and it, it infects all of us, because like I said, we, we belong to the kingdom of heaven, but unfortunately, we've been infected with values and, and ideas that come from the kingdom of this world. And one of them is, is that worship is for us. So oftentimes, we can approach worship as a consumer, and yet here we're talking about, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's about lowering myself. It's about humbling myself. It's about putting the needs of others as well as what is meaningful to God before my own. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't enjoy worship, that we can't love it, that we can't. But what it means is that once in a while, when something just doesn't strike you right or a song we sing you don't like, just remember, it's not about me. It's about God. It's about God. Barak the Lord, O my soul, and all my inmost being. Barak, his holy name. We cannot approach the worship of God like a consumer commodity. Now, I'll be honest with you. Um, um, Oftentimes, it's always interesting to me, usually on maybe a Sunday after church or maybe a Sunday afternoon, um, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be somewhere, maybe I'll go to a coffee shop or a restaurant and read a book or eat a meal, and I don't try to do it. Please understand that I'm not trying to do it, but sometimes I can't help but overhear conversations of others sitting, sitting around me. This was before everybody was sitting at least six feet apart, and so, and so but it was always interesting to me that oftentimes if it were a Sunday afternoon, They'd be, they'd be talking about their church service. And in particular, they'd be talking about the pastor of the church. And let me tell you, more times than not, it wasn't flattering, right? It, it, was, like, it was like, well, how, how was church today? Well, I, I don't know. It, it was okay. There was a guy that talked too long, had a boring voice, and told stale jokes, and talked about Indiana basketball too much. And like, it, it was maybe, maybe, maybe a six or, or maybe a seven or something like that. And, and then they sang this song that I don't like. Why can't we sing the, the, the good old songs? There was this one song they sang that it was too loud. There was this guitar, and it just repeated over and over and over the same thing. And I was thinking to myself, oh, Lord. Like, thank you. Thank you, God, that I am not in a church where people would go, where people would go and have roast preacher after church because, because, because my people would never say such things and be so consumer. Some of you are laughing, like I don't, not be so consumer mental, 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 consumer mental, right? Um, But the focus, if we're not careful in worship, can become all about me, my likes, my likes, my dislikes, my needs, all about me. When worship, worship needs to be a time where we get our eyes off of ourselves, off of our problems, off of our situations, and we put them on God who is above all of these things. In other words, Zamar. Zamar, I like like the word Zamar for praise because it means to pluck the strings of an instrument with joyful expression. 
It's about making music to God with, with stringed instruments. And so I, so I like that one. And, and the, the idea is that you literally are plucking them by hand, but you pluck them hard. Now, this isn't some acoustic spa music, right? This is, this is loud music. This is electric guitars. This is drums. This is loud and proud if it's done in an expression of fanatic passion for God. But yeah, God likes to be, likes to be worshipped that way. Pluck the strings of an instrument with joyful expression. I don't know if you noticed it or not, and, and I'll be honest with you, I haven't caught the last two Sundays uh, here yet, but oftentimes when Jordan is leading worship, I don't know if you've noticed this, I'm going to pick on Jordan, but he'll oftentimes be playing a guitar, but he'll have another one here. Because there was a time when Jordan, and I don't know, maybe he's just stronger than I am, because I've never done this, but Jordan, he would break strings on the guitar, and he would be so paranoid about doing that that he wanted to have one ready close by that he could just, without you even even knowing it. He could just switch him out and he could start playing again. A joyful, joyful expression, playing with your heart. My son Daniel is a, does campus ministry at University of Tennessee and he plays guitar as well. And when he was in high school, I remember um, one night he was, he was playing guitar and leading the, the youth group in worship. But before that, he asked me if he could, Dad, could I use your guitar tonight? And I had just gotten a new guitar and I was really proud of it. But I'm like, okay, yeah, but you better not have anything happen to it or something will happen to you. And so anyway, after, after church was over that night, I looked at my guitar again and I looked inside the sound hole. And I kid you not, there were these little, little specks of blood inside my guitar, my brand new guitar. I said, son, what, what in the world? He said, I don't know. He said, I, did, I guess I just played so hard that I cut myself and I started bleeding. Like, I think that'd be a good example of Zamar. I said to Daniel, I said, well, son, that's, that's awesome that you, that, you, that you play with such joyful expression. I said, but next time you want to be so, ex, so joyfully expressive, why don't you use your own guitar, right? And not, and not use mine anymore. But listen, when the, when, the, when, the, when the praise band or whoever's playing that day, when, when we're playing, understand it's not, it's not a performance. Nobody who sings or plays wants the spotlight necessarily to be on us in this room. And, and while, while they appreciate well-meaning comments from people that say, you know what, when, when you were leading in worship, it's so good, you guys sounded so great. What they'd, what they'd rather hear you say, you know, when you were leading worship and I was, I was in worship, I saw God so much bigger. And I saw myself so much smaller. You shine the light on God. Thank you so much for doing that. Zamar. So Psalm 92.1 is a great verse for this. It is good. It is good to Zamar the Lord and make music to your name almost high. It is good to, to praise the Lord with exuberant music. Sometimes that you might even break a string in God. So another one, Shabbat, Shabbat. If you speak Hebrew, you've got to have that ch, that ch sound, you know, like you're coughing up a hairball or something. But Shabbat, 3,000 years ago, God said, I want you to praise me with shouts. I want you to address me in loud tones. Psalm 63 says, because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will Shabbat you. As long as I live, I will shout in a loud tone and I will lift up my hands. Now, there are 150 chapters in the book of Psalms. And I personally believe that the last one, Psalm 150, kind of summarizes the whole, the whole book. And it talks about praising him with the blast of the ram's horn, praising him with the lyre and harp, with tambourine and dancing. You're like, you're like I, I don't dance. I know that. And that's probably a good thing. We don't have to do all of these, Okay. Um, some have that gift. They really do, and it's a beautiful thing. Strings and flute, clash of cymbals with loud clanging cymbals. Clash those cymbals really loud. You say, well, I don't like, like, I don't like loud music. And I get that, and we try to be cognizant of that. But listen, the Bible teaches that praise in heaven is so loud. It's going to be, it's going to be louder than the, than the loudest thunder or the loudest waterfall on earth. Or, or here, here's what I think of. It's going to be louder than sitting trackside at the Michigan 400 Speedway for, for, for a NASCAR race. How many of you have ever done that? How many of you have ever been to a NASCAR race? We, we went to one a couple summers ago. Lori was singing the national anthem at it. And somebody said to me, Chris, you, you, you need to take earplugs. And I'm kind of like, blah. You know, kind of like some people are about masks, you know, bah, I don't need no earplugs. I've been to concerts all my life. I don't whatever. 
I about died. I'm telling you, I about, it, it was so loud. It was the loudest thing I've ever, ever been to. And combined with that and the fact that you get coated with rubber from the tires, it was a really unique experience. But, but heaven is going to be this place that is just going to be, it's going to be loud praise to God. And I think this makes sense. I think this, doesn't this make sense? How many of you would like to go, for example, to a, to a ball game and sit next to somebody at this ball game who is always shushing you? Shh, shh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to watch this game. Can you, can you, can you keep it down? Or maybe you've, you know, been at a concert and somebody, and you've been standing up and having a good time and somebody behind you is yelling at you to sit down and be quiet so they can hear the music, right? I mean, I mean, that person just really wasn't very nice to me when, when I did that. And so I, so, but the louder, the louder, the better. Here's one, Toda. Toda is another one that talks about lifting hands in praise, lifting hands in adoration to God. Um, many, many words for uh, praise have to do with lifted hands in worship, but this one, this one is a little bit different. This one has the flavor, Toda has the flavor of, I will worship you, I will adore you, I will, I will lift hands to glorify you, even when and especially when things are not going well in my life. Even when I'm having, like I'm having a hard time finding you, I'm having a hard time seeing you, in spite of that, I will lift my hands to worship you. So it's, it's kind of a context of, 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 of I, will, I will lift my hands to you and I will surrender. I will surrender whatever it is that is, that is holding me back from you. And it's interesting that what is the, what is, in a war situation, what is the universal, one of the universal signs for surrender? It's raised hands, isn't it? See, I surrender, I just surrender to you, God. Like, I'll just, I'll just let you take over. I know that you got me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I can and pray what I can, but Lord, ultimately it's in your hands, and I just want to give this back to you. Psalm 50, 23 says, He who offers toda, who offers praise in the midst, in the midst of uncertainty, glorifies me. It's all about raised hands and surrendering to God in worship. And listen, I've been a pastor for going on 30 years now, and I can tell you, I can tell you this is, this is probably one of, the, one of the most difficult ways that people worship. Because what I've observed too often in ministry and in churches is that it's in times like this that people need to worship most often. Yet it's, it's the hardest to do. It's the hardest to do. You don't understand. You're angry with God. You're upset for your circumstances. And God understands all of that. So please do not let those times keep you from lifting your hands to God and surrendering to him. Because listen, that's like the only thing, the only thing that's going to get you through it. Now, the seventh word I want to share with you is, is kind of my favorite. And I, I'm going to have you say this word with me. It's this, remember, you have to have H, you got to have, in, in Hebrew, the H's are, so it's this word, tehila. So say that with me, tehila. Tequila. Now, that sounds like what? <laughs> Some of you knew that a little too quickly, a bunch of heathens. <laughs> yeah, that's what it sounds like. Verse 34, 1. I will, I will extol the Lord at all times, and his tequila, I love this, will always be on my lips. Now, I don't know. If you think about that for a moment, I don't know if God intended that, but it's just interesting to think about that his tequila will always be on my lips. No, God is not saying, go out and drink some tequila. But kind of the effect is the same. So what does this word tequila mean? It means, again, to, to, to sing exuberantly. God loves it when we sing exuberantly. It's, it's singing and especially exuberant singing. So Psalms talks about instruments. Psalms talks also about how we are to sing, how we are to sing. And you say, Chris, I understand what it says, but I don't sing. And we know that, like, and, and God knows that. We can hear you. Why do you think we play loud sometimes? And, and, so, and so I don't know about you, but we are made in the image of God. And so for a follower of Jesus Christ, you know, you may think that I can't sing. You, you got you to sing somehow. Maybe it's just in your, in your head, in your heart. But exuberant singing would mean that you sing out. And I don't know. This is just, this is just my theory. 
my theory, but, uh, but I think that even if you're an awful singer, I think that somehow God runs your voice through some sort of heavenly auto-tune. And so when he hears it, like it's a, it's a melodious, it's like the most beautiful, beautiful thing. So sing exuberantly. Even you think, well, I can't, I can't sing. Uh, sing, even if you never get a four-chair turnaround on the voice. Sing with a full heart because you'll get a standing ovation from the only chair that really matters, and that is the throne of the Lord God Almighty. And it says that he inhabits in, and he basks in the praise of his people. Now, I know that there are some people I've heard to come to church or have come to church intentionally late because they don't, they don't like the music, they don't like the singing, whatever it might be. And so they want to skip sort of what, what I've heard them refer to as the preliminaries and, and get there in time for sermon and communion and the preaching of God's word. And that is like a mistake. It is totally antithetical to what we're here to do. Uh, listen, the worship team is not my warm-up band, okay? Like, I, like I'm not touring with my warm-up band. Uh, as awesome as they would be to do that, that's not what it's about. And we can agree to disagree on this, but I want to tell you right now, my, my opinion is that the most important thing about the service, the main event, so to speak, isn't the sermon. It's not even communion. It's not even the music. But the most important thing about worship is what? Somebody say God. God, you're right. You guys are so brilliant this morning. It's God. It's God, and all, everything that we do, everything that we do, whether it's sung or spoken or prayed or whatever it might be, is, is part of how we worship God. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. It points to him and not to us. God is the main event. So that's the, the, the why we worship, the how we worship. But I want to talk for just a moment about, about who we worship, who we worship. And this is really, this is really what it's all about. Philippians chapter 2 describes a God who descended into greatness to serve others. And he humbled himself and became obedient to death, putting his desires, his hopes, his aspirations aside so that he could do something that only he could do for you and me. And he suffered even death on a cross for you and me so that we could have freedom and hope and salvation. And then Philippians 2 continues in verse 9. Therefore, it says, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And it, so it talks about his name. And you know as well as I do that there is power in names. There's power in names. I heard of a, heard of a polite burglar prided himself on the fact that he never woke anybody up. You guys, some of you aren't listening to this. This is a really good joke. You need to listen. So, so, so this was a very, very polite burglar. He never, he never woke. I mean, some of you would be like, I think he's wrapping it up now. Let's get our stuff together. No, I'm not even near done. So just settle in, all right? Anyway, polite burglar. He prided himself on the fact that he never disturbed the people that he went in to rob. But one, one night he made a mistake and he woke up the couple as he was ransacking their bedroom and, and they looked at him. He said, oh, I'm sorry that I woke you up, but now that you've seen me, you know that I, you know that I, I can't leave in witnesses. He said, so I have, to, I have to kill you. He said, but before I do, like, like I'd like to know your name. He was a very considerate burglar, right? So he said, ma'am, what, what is your name? And she said, well, my name, my name is, is Elizabeth. He said, oh, Elizabeth, that was my mother's name. He said, I, I, can't, I can't kill you. He turned to the man. He said, sir, well, what is your name? He said, well, my name is Bill, but my friends call me Elizabeth. And so, like, there, like, there, is, there is power, power to save in names. Thank you. Thank you. But listen, there is no, there is no name more powerful than Jesus Christ. And one day, says Philippians, his name, his name will be lifted high and everybody will know, every, everybody will know, believer, unbeliever, the whole earth will know that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you know, if we go back through all 66 books of the Bible, the name of Jesus is lifted up. We might not read the name of Jesus, but make no mistake about it, that Jesus is in the Bible from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. And I want to kind of go through these uh, for a couple minutes and explain how this works. How Jesus is in even the Old Testament. 
So in Genesis, Jesus is our creator. In Exodus, he's our Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's our high priest. In Numbers, he guides us with a cloud uh, by day and a pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's the coming prophet who is greater than Moses. In Joshua, he's the captain of, sal- of our salvation. In Judges, he's the judge and the lawgiver. In Ruth, he is our kinsman redeemer. In Samuel, he is the shepherd king who rushes out to face our giants for us. In Kings, he is the righteous leader. In Chronicles, he is the restorer of the kingdom. In Ezra, he is the faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he is the one who restores what is broken. In Esther, he is the protector of his people. In Job, he is the redeemer and the healer. In Psalms, he is the shepherd who hears our cries and leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. In Proverbs, he is our daily wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he is our very meaning to life. In the Song of Solomon, he's the author of faithful love. In Isaiah, he is the suffering servant and the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, he is the righteous one. In Lamentations, he is the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he is the son of man. In Daniel, he is the stranger in the fire with us. In Hosea, he is the faithful husband even when we are unfaithful and run away. In Joel, he is the restorer of all that the locusts have eaten. In Amos, he is our advocate for justice. In Obadiah, he is our, he's mighty to save. In Jonah, he is the great missionary. In Micah, he is our faithful messenger. In Nahum, Christ is our strength and our shield. In Habakkuk, Christ is our reason to rejoice even when the fields are empty and even when we have to wait. In Zephaniah, Christ is our warrior who saves us and rejoices over us with dancing and singing. In Haggai, he is our cleansing fountain. In Zechariah, in Zechariah, he's the fountain flowing to take away our sins. And in Malachi, he is the son of righteousness who brings healing. Now that's just in the Old Testament, but he is there throughout it. You get to the New Testament, and Christ is the King of Kings in Matthew. He is the Lord, the Son of God in Mark. He is the Savior born in the city of David in Luke. In John, he is the Word became flesh who dwelt among us. In Acts, he is the Spirit who dwells within his people. In Romans, he is the righteousness of God. In Corinthians, he is the power and the love of God. In 2 Corinthians, he is the down payment of what's to come. In Galatians, he is the liberty that sets us free. In Ephesians, he is our righteous armor. In Philippians, he is our peace and he is the joy of our lives. In Colossians, he is the firstborn over all creation who triumphed over evil on the cross. In 1 Thessalonians, he is the comfort of our last days. In 2 Thessalonians, he is the coming king. In 1 Timothy, he is the savior of the worst of sinners. In 2 Timothy, he is the leader of the leaders. In Titus, he is the faithful shepherd pastor. In Philemon, he is the freer of slaves and he is our redeemer. In Hebrews, he is our great high priest, unequaled and unmatched by any others. In James, he is the power behind our faith. In First and Second Peter, he is our living cornerstone. In First, Second, and Third John, he is our advocate pleading for us. And in Jude, he is the foundation of our faith, passed on once and for all to the saints. And in Revelation, in Revelation, he is, well, he's the first and the last. He's the beginning and the end. He's the lamb slain before the foundations of the world. And in Revelation, he is coming again. He is coming again and he will make all things new because he always was, always is, always will be. He's the unmoved, unchanged, uncreated, undefeated, never undone. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we declare when we meet together in worship, we declare not to us, Not to us, Lord, but to your kingdom and your power and your glory forever and ever and ever. Amen.